You know, I really look forward to working on this one. Tonight, we're going to talk about the work of Cinnamon Hervey. <laughs> it's too exciting. I can understand all your enthusiasm. I'm, I'm with you. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. Here is a monthly podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. In past episodes, I've offered profiles of the genealogists like William Dugdale, J.S. Byrne and W.E. Tate. Now, all of those gentlemen contributed to the study of genealogy. But tonight we're going to look at a genealogist who deserves to be remembered simply for the amount of work that he did. Siderman Hervey is probably best known by the four letters of his signature that you'll find on his work. S-H-A-H. Siderman Henry Augustus Hervey. Because Hervey worked so hard, he left behind many examples of how we would do well to follow him, and that's why I wanted to give him episode 17 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. But first, I need to remind you that I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast like you, who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned on the way. And as usual, I do need to emphasise, I am talking about ancestor hunting in England. Hervey was the third son of the Bishop of Bath and Wells, and after Oxford, he went into the church. It was in the parish of Wedmore that we first see the fruits of S.H.A.H.'s labours in history. He produced transcripts of the registers of his parish, as well as a regular notes and queries journal, which we might today call a parish magazine. From the introductions to his earliest transcripts, two themes emerge as the motivation for Hervey's efforts. Firstly, He saw genealogists and archivists working for the benefit of future generations rather than for their own satisfaction. And secondly, he wanted people to somehow connect with the documents and the people that those documents refer to. Now these are two very strong themes. So while we can picture Hervey toiling away well past his bedtime and by the flickering candlelight in his study or the vestry or the muniments room of a grand house and each of those images is faithful he was by no means a stuffy old scholar simply the extent of his output tells us that he was thrilled by the work that he was doing although he is at Wedmore for 20 years His modern take on theology wasn't well received in the higher church, and so in 1897 he moved on from his parochial duties. He was a cricket enthusiast, very much, a bell ringer and a music lover. But we remember him because of the transcripts and genealogies on which he concentrated during his retirement. This is one of those cases when retirement really does seem to be the completely wrong word as if he hadn't already left a sufficient mark. He died in 1944, aged 99. His work can be divided into hefty chunks. The Redmore Papers, edited versions of his family's work, and the Suffolk Green Books. He also wrote one-offs, like the distribution of the Hervey surname and a list of old boys from a school. When I spoke about W.E. Tate... I suggested that it would be difficult to produce a complete bibliography of his work, and the same goes for Hervey. He wrote so much, including papers and letters, that I can't see anyone getting to grips with an authoritative bibliography. Well, I can actually think of one tired old chap who might have a go, but that's for another day. Okay, I cannot say that he should be a hero of genealogical science. 
in the way that Dugdale should be, for example. Hervey is a role model rather than a hero. A role model because he teaches us to get on with the work. I've said that I want to elect Hervey to my Hall of Fame because he was great at doggedly slogging his way through bushels of old papers and coming up smiling. Despite the travail, he produced work which feels fresh. Now, I have used this clip before, but I want to insert it here because it shows his approach. He is writing about his edition of the Suffolk half-tax returns. The printer has printed from my transcripts of Mr Musket's transcript of the original transcript of the original returns and therefore this volume stands fifth in descent from those men who actually warmed themselves at those 60,000 halves and growled at having to pay the king two shillings year by year for each of them. The index has been made in an amateurish sort of way, and I shudder when I think of the number of names likely to be admitted from it. Having had 30,000 of very small bits of paper about my room for some months, I cannot help thinking that some of them must have been lost before their time. Besides, I'm not altogether satisfied with the principles on which it has been made. In fact, I scarcely know what those principles are. And that clip introduces the second element of Hervey's work, humour. Something you rarely see from a Victorian genealogist. Here he is again, this time talking about the county's lay subsidy of 1327. I ought properly to have had the original ordinance for this grant transcribed and printed. I believe it exists among the public records, but it is probably horribly long, horribly intricate, written in Norman French and with many abbreviations, a combination of holes from which I have shrunk. However, although it might have settled a few doubtful points, yet we can get on fairly well without it. The humour was well placed. Hervey is assuring us that the old Latin or Norman French authority might have lent academic legitimacy to his book, but it would have been of no practical use. We did not need it, so he carried on without it. Hervey was a serious and conscientious genealogist, but essentially he was always a practical one, which, of course, makes his work immensely readable. Now, the two volumes that I have mentioned, the hearth tax and the lay subsidy, both of Suffolk, they are in the Suffolk Green Book series, so perhaps we should spend a couple of minutes looking along that bookshelf. Now, when Norman Scarf, a Suffolk historian, who I was surprised to learn died only in 2014, aged 90, when Scarf celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Suffolk Record Society, he quickly paid tribute to Hervey as part of the prehistory of that movement. He said, Long before and single-handedly, Cinnamon Hervey gave a head start to publishing Suffolk records. Between 1894 and 1929, he produced nearly 30 Suffolk Green books. It is interesting, said Scarf, that W.G. Hoskins, a guest speaker at the 1967 AGM, made this connection and congratulated the Society on continuing the Green Book series. Perhaps our volumes in green livery is a tribute to Hervey. OK, the series from Hervey included a wide variety of documents, parish registers, school rolls, wills, again family papers. The fact that most, if not all, have been subsequently digitised and made available free online means that no genealogist with an interest in Suffolk roots 
can fairly ignore their debt to Hervey. I have quoted from two of the books, The Half Tax and The Lay Subsidy. These volumes include examples of Hervey's explanatory introduction to his books. These can be trusted. He knew his subject. In fact, if anyone was tasked to lecture on these subjects today, his scripts would produce a detailed, well-argued and neatly arranged brief. Both have stood the test of time. And once you've picked up a familiarity with his written voice, they come across like a familiar tutor sitting at the other side of the hearth, passing on his wisdom through a cloud of pipe smoke. There is another strength to his work. He clearly prefers to keep clear of other people's interpretations of the records. When he is forced to deal with family tradition, portraits on the staircase and family trees of dubious truths, as in his History of the German Family, which we'll talk about later, Hervey does not hide sceptical inclinations as he goes in search of cooperation or at least reconciliation with other sources. I think this, his reliance on the original documents that we know and trust, is why today's genealogist can feel so much at home with his work. And then he invites us to share in the magic, the romance of it all. Again, I want to repeat Hervey's opening paragraph to his uh, edition of the Suffolk Returns, a volume first published in 1905. I know I've used it before, but it does stand repetition. This volume carries us into every town, village and hamlet in Suffolk in 1674. Sets us down at the door of each house, gives us the name of the occupier and tells us how many fires he had in his house. It is a complete directory for Suffolk in the 17th century, completer far than any that Kelly or White gave us for the reign of Queen Victoria. The names of those who were exempted from paying rates by reason of the poverty are given as well as the names of those who had to pay. The great mansion containing 20 to 50 hearths, the small squire's house containing 10 to 20, the parsonage and the yeoman's house containing six, more or less, the tottering cottages with only one. Here they are all set down together with those who were lucky or unlucky to warm or shiver within them. This volume will not tell us who's who, but it will tell us who's where and where's who, and that is often what we want to know. With both the half tax and the lay subsidy, Hervey realised that we are likely to misinterpret the information unless we know how the tax was calculated and how the tax was collected. So he takes us through these processes in quite some detail. He knows that it is essential for the names in the documents to come alive. Here he is again, this time from his introduction to the lay subsidy volume. This volume contains nothing more than a long list of men's names. Each name under the township in which the man had his taxable property and followed by the amount of tax he had to pay. Nothing more than that. And yet it seems to me to contain a very large amount of raw material for the medieval history of Suffolk. And I cannot but marvel that we have crossed the threshold of the 20th century before anyone has taken the trouble to print it. Of course, what is here printed had often been consulted in manuscript and a bit here and a bit there nibbled off. But things lying in manuscript do not tell the tale that lies told within them, nor does the nibbling get it out of them. Before that tale can be fully told, one must have the whole thing in such a compact and legible form as only the printer can give, with the addition of that still compacted form which only an index can give. Here, in this volume, we have, I hope, those two things needful and no more inaccuracy than must be expected. 
There, in one paragraph, we have both his motivation and purpose of the true parochial historian. You know, I can hardly recommend these books too highly. They are instructive in detail and invite you to embark upon a practical exercise by using the names and the data in the way that Hervey has suggested. OK, let's have 20 seconds of music before we look further at the old man's work. Talk Genealogy, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Can I remind you that the show notes for this and previous episodes can be found on the website talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. That website includes a full bibliography of the books that I've mentioned in the series and, of course, a complete listing of all the episodes with links to match. You'll also find some links to some of my other work on genealogy and perhaps here I could sneak in a word or two about a book which I have recently privately published. The Horse Bulls tells the story of four brothers in my family tree who were pivotal in the development of their local cricket team from about 1800 to 1830. It focuses on the market town of Bingham in Nottingham and apart from the pedigree charts of the family also includes the true statements of several of those early cricket matches. You'll find a page about the book, The Horse Balls, on the website that supports this podcast and my personal website, MalcolmNoble.com. Now, let's have a look back in the journal. If you were listening to this podcast one year ago, that would be December 2016, the latest would be episode 5, called Too Many Suspects. Now, let's just take a peek at what was going on with that one an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Three Jones with the same surname, born in the same village, within the same five years. And not for the first time we wonder why our ancestors could not have employed a little more imagination when they stood at the Christmas. This is one of those problems that you mention to folk at your local family history group and you get, ah, that shows the value of collateral lines. And then the wise old soldier wanders off, leaving you none the wiser. You knew all about collateral lines, but what are you supposed to do with them? The podcast is still available. Catch the link on the talkgenealogy.wordpress.com website. And now, before we go back to tonight's podcast, I'd like to mention the paper of mine which appears on the online journal of genealogy and family history. It's called Answers in the Wind, a look at how the study of weather can help the family historian. And I've spoken about that in previous podcasts. Just search for the journal, Journal of Genealogy and Family History, and you'll find that you can download the paper for free. You're listening to Talk Genealogy with Malcolm Noble. So far, I hope that I've demonstrated that one of Hervey's gifts was an ability to work hard at genealogy. A template I think is especially noteworthy for today's genealogists with too much time on their hands. Now I want to look at a third example of his work that evidences that trait. Go to a local study section of any provincial library and you'll find attractive Victorian and Edwardian books being transcriptions of the old local and otherwise unknown parishes. Often the work is offered by an incumbent or a member of the vestry. They may give an account of the condition of the registers, often with a regretful note that the previous books were stolen, and perhaps a summary of other notes on the end papers. But Harvey's registers of Rushbrook include not only baptisms, marriages and burials, but also the briefs, monumental inscriptions inside and out, notable wills. All of his transcripts are like this. You always get more than you should. It's in the same volume that he brings together the annals of the German family. 
And I like the way he did it. He allowed space for the family traditions, the portraits on the staircases, the elaborately painted but possibly dubious pedigrees, and he put them in their context, that is to say, he put them in their place. He travelled to look at different sources and memorials, and he takes us with him. So, what did Hervey teach us? Well, throughout his work, again and again, he liked to keep in touch with those scribes who went before. This gives a sense of not only honesty to his work, but authenticity as well, something I think we all long for. He showed the value of working with original sources and getting to know the processes that sat behind them so we can see how best to interpret them. He told us to cast our net wide. Registers, family papers, old letters, biographers who went before, all need to be entertained, although all treated with care. Another element that I've picked up from Hervey's work is a liking to step back and look at the overall shape of things. And that sort of broad view really does make sense. Hervey was not a radical. He found no new ways of doing things. He opened no new public institutions. He was a genealogist and he worked hard at it. And you know, he comes across as a really nice chap. He lays down a challenge for the rest of us. What are we going to do to match his example? What new sources are we transcribing before they are lost? And you know, that really is a challenge in these days of digitization, character recognition and powerful search engines. But we need to pick up that gauntlet and set ourselves a mammoth, Hervey-sized project and bring something original and worthwhile and most of all something fresh to the libraries of genealogists for folks to use after we've gone along on our way. Here's some earlier episodes of the podcast. Episode 15, Let's Talk of Graves, of Worms, of Epitaphs. Episode 13 was about the hearth tax. Episode 12, and it was Shakespeare, for example. Episode 9 discussed the medieval pipe rolls. Go to episode 7 for the companions of William the Conqueror. Episode 2, The Herald's Visitations, and our very first episode looked at working with Tudor Wills. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Thank you for listening to episode 17 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. Can I remind you that the show notes for tonight's episode can be found on the talkgenealogy.wordpress.com website, as well as links to previous episodes. The next episode will be posted at 7.30pm UK time on the 3rd of January. My thanks to Freeze Effects for the music, Emily Brooks for the voiceover, and thanks you for listening. And oh, if you're listening in December 2017, Merry Christmas. Good night.